You see, the reality is all of us want glory. Everyone in this room, every one of us hungers for glory. And by glory, I mean greatness. We want to be great. None of us live our lives saying, I just want to live a mediocre life, do nothing, and die. None of us do that. We want to be significant. Biblically, glory is weightiness, significance, what matters. Glory is something of value. You want your life to count. You want it to matter. You want it to mean something for someone. You want your work to matter, your ministry to matter, your moms, you want to leave a mark on your children as you raise them. Fathers, you as well. Ambition is not wrong, but a good thing only when the ultimate chase, that ultimate pursuit, that search for glory is found in the person and work of Jesus. It's wrong when it's all about you and what you can do. See, the Pharisees in the Gospel of John that we've been studying and seeing are ambitious people, but their ambition is directed toward the wrong end, and thus they miss the forest for the trees, and they have glory standing right in front of them, but they reject him. And that's not unique for just the Pharisees, but for everyone that pursues glory in some form, but they reject Jesus. For some... This glory, this greatness is found in being number one. It's like in athletics where you have a person that wants the glory of winning. They desperately want to be on top and have people see them as great, as champions. In the movie, We Are Marshals, the coach um, speaks to his players, sets them down before the game, and he says, how you play today from this moment on is how you are going to be remembered. This is your opportunity to rise from the ashes and grab glory. For some, glory or greatness is found on the battlefield. For many cultures, the greatest glory and worth is found in being a war hero or dying on the front lines in the movie Pearl Harbor. As the fighting begins, one of the soldiers cries out, remember, pain is temporary, but glory is forever. In Beowulf, it said, if we die, it will be for glory, not for gold. For some, greatness or glory is found not in what one does, but in what one possesses. And that's a lot like our culture today. What you have and what you know and who you know is king. And the more people you know and the more things you have, the greater your sense of value or worth or significance. The movie Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, Indy's little friend, short round, asks why they're going to the temple and Indiana Jones replies, fortune and glory, kid, fortune and glory. You see, deep in our hearts is a desire for something great, a desire for glory, a desire for ambition. We desire by design, but if we're not careful, our ambition can be turned in the wrong direction. Our culture is after that incommunicable and unappeasable want. As C.S. Lewis says, it is a secret significance of every soul. There is an appetite in your soul for life and hope and meaning and glory. But these searches out in the world are vain because every one of them leave you empty, unsatisfied, and desiring more. There's only one thing that satisfies. There's only one thing that fulfills, only one thing that never abandons you, only one thing that never fails you, only one thing that never breaks down on you, and it's not a thing, it's a person, the glory of Jesus. John wrote the gospel for this very purpose that we've been studying. John 20 tells us why John wrote it, and he said, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that by believing, you would have life. That by believing him, you would have life. You see, your innate desire, ambition for glory, for, val- for life, it's not no evolutionary connection. It was placed in you by Jesus for Jesus. You were created for something greater than a mirror, something greater than likes on Instagram or Facebook, something greater than what money can buy you. You were created for the glory of God in the face of Jesus. You were created to have God as your highest good, your greatest glory. We all need the glory of God for every moment of every day. It is the exclusion of this glory, the lack of seeing and enjoying this glory that is the source of all of our sin, 
all of our broken relationships, our anxiety, our misguided affections. And we need to taste and see that God is good. And in order to do that, we have to look for the glory of God in the face of Jesus. And the difference between a Christian and a religious person, a Pharisee per se, is that they have experienced the glory of God, not just read about it. The glory has shown in your heart. It's tapped your affections and it's changed you. It's transformed you. See, we, if you're a follower of Jesus here this morning, have seen his glory, worth, and beauty, and we have sought to find our identity, value, and worth in Jesus, not in what we own or what we possess or who we know. Whether you're a Christian or not, whether the gospel has gone in or not, you need to see the glory of Jesus. And the greatest display of God's glory is magnified on the cross. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the grave, he displayed his glory. But when he went to the cross and when he went into the grave and he rose from the dead, he displayed an even greater amount of glory than we could ever imagine. And in our passage today, we're going to discover descriptions of Jesus' glory at the cross. So look with me. John 12, verse 27. The first thing I want you to see is that Jesus is our sufferer. Jesus is our sufferer. Look at verse 27. Now is my soul troubled? What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. So Jesus has just made known his intentions to not trample Rome for the temporary military victory, but to be trampled upon himself for mankind for their eternal spiritual victory. God wasn't going to save the king as the people desired it, but rather he was going to let the king die and he's going to pour out his wrath on Jesus so that our sins could be forgiven so that God could save us. See, we now see Jesus feeling the weight of this on his life. There's this burden on Jesus that he's going to be the sin bearer and it's overwhelming for him. He's probably sitting on a donkey overlooking Jerusalem and the Gospel of Luke tells us that he's weeping over the city that in a few days is going to turn on him. And he knows that their words, Hosanna, Hosanna, as we celebrate Palm Sunday, he knows those words are futile and empty because in four days, everyone will reject him. Their ambition wasn't for Jesus, but in what Jesus could do for them. And so with tears in his eyes, he verbally confesses the turmoil of his heart, but he resolves to go ahead. And this wasn't the only time Jesus had these moments. In Luke 22, we see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it says he withdrew from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and he prayed. He said, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. But you got to ask the question, didn't Jesus know that this was going to happen? Wasn't he the one who held the entire world together? Didn't he calm a storm before? Didn't he raise a dead man before? Didn't he heal all sorts of crazy sicknesses before? Why was he shaken at the mission that was in front of him? He, was the, he has the appropriate human response of grimacing at suffering, yet he knows that this is what he has to do, and ultimately what he wants to do. Listen, no amount of knowledge about sovereignty will ever subside pain when we experience it. And it's okay to cry. It's okay to mourn. It's okay to weep. We saw this with Jesus himself in front of the tomb of Lazarus as he himself wept. Read the Psalms and you'll find brutal honesty, transparency of people that are brutally honest before God. I told you before that God longs for what lies in the depths of our soul. And in those depths, there will be pain, there will be confusion, as this is what the world is made of right now until Jesus returns. There's a re reason why the book of Job is 42 chapters, and chapter 3 through chapter 37 is all about confusion and pain and questioning God, because that's our world. It's full of pain. It's full of brokenness. But you say, but Jesus' pain wasn't physical. Jesus' pain was just physical, but it was so much more than physical. 
Jesus' suffering was more than just physical pain. It was emotional. It was relational. It was deep in his soul. Jesus knew he was about to be our sufferer. He was about to suffer the pain of loss in a relationship to his Father. And there is no greater pain than having love, having someone that you love being taken away from you. All of us have felt this extent of pain in our lives when someone close to us has been taken from us. Maybe a child has been taken from your life or a family member or maybe even to the extent of a relationship that's been broken or a spouse leaves you. Some of you had loved ones die, a spouse walk out or a child go astray. But at the most, these relationships are several years, maybe 30, 40, 50 let's say a hundred years long, but that's about it. Now imagine an infinite relationship that was never on the rocks, that never had a moment of rejection or loss, that was, lo- that was full of love and complete and perfect and communion. And now it's being taken away. Jesus was not just about to be made sin on our behalf, but he was also going to be rejected on our behalf. And he was going to be rejected by someone that had loved him for eternity. The death of Jesus was radically different from any other death that humans have experienced. The physical pain was nothing compared to the spiritual experience of cosmic abandonment by God. And yet Jesus resolves to move ahead because this was always the plan of Jesus. This was always the plan of God. This was the only way that sin could be paid for, eternal suffering alleviated, justice served, and evil put to an end without ending us in the process. Jesus is our sufferer. He is our sin bearer. Christianity is the only religion that can claim that God is not indifferent to human suffering and or immune from human suffering. Every other religion calls for you to sacrifice or work or do stuff to be accepted by a God who's out there, who's never been immune to suffering. But Christianity presents a God who not only does the work for you and sacrifices himself in order to make himself glorified, but so that you could be drawn in to him that's our faith his suffering is where we see the glory of God put on display and it draws us into why into why Jesus in a few moments will say that when he is lifted up everyone would be drawn to him Jesus is our sufferer number two Jesus is our righteousness Jesus is our righteousness look at verse 28 a voice came from heaven I have glorified it And I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered, the voice has come for your sake, not mine. So this is the third time that God has spoken audibly to Jesus for everyone to hear. He did it at the baptism when Jesus was baptized. He did it at Mount Transfiguration for the Peter, James, and John to hear. But notice that some people thought that this was a thunderstorm and they heard thunder. Others looked up into the sky and were like, wait, this is blue skies out here. That's not thunder. Others thought an angel had spoken. But notice no one seemed to sense that God was speaking. Now what I want you to notice in these verses, in these sentences of the conversation between Jesus and God, there's an absence of us. The Son wants the Father glorified. And the Father is glorified when the Son lives the perfect life and going to be glorified in His death and burial and resurrection. But there's no mention of you and I in this conversation at all. No mention of our salvation. Only they're talking about is the glory between the Father and the Son. And the focus here is that Jesus' life and death and resurrection are absolutely perfect and thus that alone is glorifying to God. You see, my, you and I, my friends, we are byproducts of the eternal plan of God. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're a byproduct of God's eternal plan. The main goal was the glory between the Father and the Son. So what does that mean for us? It means everything. It means absolutely everything. 
You and I, if you're a believer here, we reap the benefits of a relationship between the Father and the Son. The world was created out of an overflow of love between the Godhead. And those of us who put their trust in Jesus will be redeemed out of an overflow of love between the Godhead. And so because the Father was completely happy in the Son, and the Son was completely happy in the Father, now you, believer, can as a Christian, glorify Him. You're caught up into this love by just being. You're caught up by just being. Think about that for a moment. You are in the plan of God. You are caught up in the love of God by simply being. How's that possible? Don't I have to glorify God by what I say and what I do? God is glorified in you and accepts you because of what we call the doctrine of imputation. Imputation is a transfer of benefit from one individual to another. It's an accounting term. A ton of accountants in here, right? On the cross, God transfers your sin and guilt onto Jesus and as a result transfers Jesus' perfection and beauty to you. Martin Lloyd-Jones calls this the great exchange. So how is God glorified in you? By you simply being in Jesus. Listen, you don't have to lift a finger to be glorifying God or to be accepted by God or to be loved by God. You just need to be in Jesus. You need to just accept acceptance. You say, but what about my practical day-to-day life? What about how I live my day life? See, once you understand your position, once you understand your status, once you understand that God has given his life for you, then you would want to live for this incredible, loving, glorious God. A person who's melted by the gospel. A person who's been captured by the fact that Jesus would die for them. A person that revels in their status will then want God to be made much of in their lives. It will make you a quicker repenter than a slower repenter because you realize that God hasn't abandoned you and is never going to abandon you. Jesus is our sufferer. Jesus is our righteousness. Thirdly, Jesus is our redeemer. Jesus is our redeemer. Look at verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Jesus now turns to the crowd and he displays some urgency to the crowd. And notice twice he says now. He says two things are about to happen. There's going to be judgment and there's going to be a serping. A verdict and a commandeering. A sentence and a hijacking. And all of this is going to happen on the cross. Now imagine the crowd. We talked about them last week. As, the, as Jesus rode into Jerusalem and they were standing there waving palm, tree, palm leaves, yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, they were thinking completely, something completely different from what Jesus talks about. They in no doubt were giddy like a four-year-old at a candy store thinking that they were about to be delivered. There were two things that the crowd wanted. They wanted judgment on Rome and they wanted Caesar to be thrown down. But the judgment that Jesus is speaking about is sin being dealt a dying blow and Satan being thrown out. Look at that first one for a second. Judgment of this world. Judgment is both positive and negative there. First, it's positive in that the cross is going to judge sin. Sin will have its day in court and be sentenced to capital punishment. Jesus will become our Redeemer. Redemption is the idea of sinful humans being brought back from the bondage of sin into a relationship with God by the payment of Jesus' death. You and I, we go to work, we put in our hours, and we get a paycheck that goes into our bank accounts. Same is true of sin. You sin, you put in your hours, and you get a paycheck that you take into death and hell. And see, God would be unjust to sweep sin under the cosmic rug of the universe He would be evil not to pay, not to repay injustice. And so instead of giving you your sin paycheck in hell, he sends Jesus right into hell for you. 
But this judgment is also negative. Negative in that the cross will serve as a judgment of the world's rejection of Jesus. Listen, if you reject Jesus, then you will get your own sin's paycheck. What you do with Jesus means everything. What you do with him matters for eternity. Can I say this? It's not your response to a church. It's not your response to an organization. It's not your response to some TV preacher that promotes a gospel that's not from the Bible. That's not what matters, but it's how do you respond to Jesus? So many people in our culture today are rejecting religion because of what they see happen in the church, but what they don't realize is at the same time they're rejecting Jesus. And the question of the hour is what are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with him? Are you going to turn to him or are you going to reject him? Because are you going to turn to him or are you going to reject him because of how someone has smeared his name? Listen, don't play the fool and end up in hell claiming that it's someone else's fault. Brothers, sisters, Jesus is our Redeemer. That means you are so flawed, that you are so broken, that you are so sinful in your sin, that it cost God his life. That should kill your self-righteousness. But at the same time, it means that you are so loved that he would willingly do it. And that should give you incredible security and boldness. Tim Keller says it this way, the cross undermines both swaggering and sniveling. I cannot feel superior to anyone, and yet I have nothing to prove to anyone. I don't think more of myself or less of myself. Instead, I think of myself less. I don't need to notice myself how I'm doing, how I'm being regarded so often. Jesus is our Redeemer. He's our sacrifice. He's our righteousness. He's our Redeemer. But notice also, He's our victor. Jesus is our victor. Verse 31 again. Now is the judgment of the world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Jesus wasn't speaking as the people thought that He was going to overtake Rome and Caesar, but rather he was talking about a much more powerful ruler, the one that was behind Caesar, Satan himself. Jesus' upcoming death on the cross is about to send a final blow to Satan's regime. Satan had been fighting the kingdom of God since God created the world. He went after Eve in the garden and duped both her and Adam into walking away from God. And so God gives the promise that he will ultimately have victory over Satan. And from that moment, there was this battle that ensued. And Satan threw his very best at every man, especially at children of God. And when Jesus came into the earth, he went after Jesus all through his earthly life. Satan attempted to hinder the incarnation of Jesus, but Jesus was still born. He went after every son in David's line to end it, but he couldn't do that either. Then Satan attempted to ruin Jesus' life, but Jesus never would sin. He tried to get him to abandon his mission and take over as king. And then Satan attempted to destroy the power of Jesus, but Jesus rose victoriously. And at the cross, when Satan thought that he had dealt the final blow to Jesus, having stirred up Judas to betray him, the Jews to desire his death, and the Romans to crucify him, the Bible says he only bruised the heel of Jesus because in three days Jesus rose from the grave and he squashed the hell of Satan. Colossians 2 says it, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood between us with its legal demands. And then he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers, the authorities, and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. See, in doing so, Jesus made Satan a defeated foe. 
Jesus was triumphant as king and released from Satan's power and influence. Satan, listen, Jesus was triumphant as king, and as a result, you and I are released from Satan's power and influence. Satan has no right over us, no deed on us. Jesus didn't pay Satan simply a ransom, but he walked across enemies' lines, punched Satan in the face, and took back what was his, and began saying, this one's mine, that one's mine. You have no right over them. Jesus is our victor. Colossians 1 says, He delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. You see, Satan will try to overcome the kingdom of Jesus, but Jesus will reign forever. Listen, friends, because your greatest enemies have been conquered, because Jesus is victorious, because you are more than a conqueror through Jesus. Now you can have courage and grace to fight lesser enemies of your life. Things like fear and doubt and shame and pride and greed and lust and envy and jealousy and anger. You can fight because Jesus is your victor. John Calvin would say, let Satan do the worst he can. Let all the powers of hell embattle themselves against us and yet we shall overcome. Jesus is our sufferer. Jesus is our righteousness. Jesus is our redeemer. Jesus is our victor. Jesus is our reconciler. Jesus is our reconciler. Verse 32. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said to so, show this by what kind of death he was going to die. Can you imagine the shock on the crowd's face when they heard Jesus say this. Jesus is going to be lifted high from the earth and be suspended between heaven and earth. He's not going to overtake Rome. He's not going to defeat the Romans. Notice, it is Jesus that draws you in. You didn't find Jesus. Jesus found you. Jesus drew you in. If you're a follower of Jesus, this is why Paul would say, yeah, there's nothing that you can boast of because you didn't find him. You weren't on the search for him. He drew you in. Notice he, draw, he draws you in. He doesn't drive you in. By the cross, Jesus melts our hearts and in a sense, he woos us to himself. We call this irresistible grace. Grace that is irresistible. When our eyes are open to who we are and to who He is and what He has done, we are drawn to Him. Jesus is the greatest attraction because He is glory. He is what we've been looking for our entire lives. This is why if you're here, you will hear a lot about Jesus here. You will hear about Jesus week in and week out. We don't offer free giveaways on Easter. We're not doing mass marketing to get people in. But God is doing some amazing stuff in our community. God is transforming hearts. I listen to you guys week in and week out of what God is doing in community groups, what God is doing in some of your individual lives. Why? Because we're making much of Jesus. Jesus is what changes people. And it's not because of me, and it's not because of our worship, and it's not because of our sermons. It is because of Jesus. Jesus is the centerpiece. His glory has to be put on the center. Listen, we have no other theme. We have no other chorus to sing. There is no show. There is no gimmicks. There is no magic. Just Jesus. And that is by God's grace how we will keep it. People may go for church for a while out of fear and guilt and eventually will stop going. But if Jesus and his cross are the centerpiece, then Jesus himself will draw them in. Ari Tori would say, preach any Christ but a crucified Christ and you will not draw men for long. And so here Jesus is saying that by his death, he will draw people from every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation, just like the Greeks who are no doubt standing next to him, and he'll bring them to himself, and we call that reconciliation. You were brought into a relationship with God. You go from being an enemy to a friend, 
from being at war with God to being at peace with God, from being hostile to being welcomed, from being blind to seeing, from being deaf to hearing, from death to life. Jesus not only suffers for sin, he removes sin, he defeats Satan, but he also restores the relationship back to how it was before the fall. And subsequently, what he will do one day when he returns, he will make us restored back to God forever and ever. The essence of Christianity The essence of our faith is a relationship with God, restoration. This speaks volumes to your life, personally, socially, culturally, missionally. Personally, this means that he wants to communicate with you and you with him, which is the Bible and prayer. The pages of scripture are screaming out the glory of God, but listen, you need to look. Socially, This means that you are to demonstrate this relationship in your relationships with others by befriending people in our city who are not not like you and reconciling with enemies and those who you hold a grudge with. Culturally, this means that you are to work at restoring society and culture to God's original design, make a difference in our world. Missionally, it means that you are given a ministry of helping people see the joy of being reconciled to God you are, he has reconciled you so that you can be a reconciler. Jesus is our sufferer. Jesus is our righteousness. Jesus is our redeemer. Jesus is our victor. Jesus is our reconciler. Finally, Jesus is our adopter. Jesus is our adopter. There's a reason I didn't tell you how many points we had in the beginning of the sermon. If some of you would freak out. Jesus is our adopter. Verse 34. So the crowd answered him, We've heard from the law that Christ remains forever. We've heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? What is this Son of Man? The crowd is dumbfounded by Jesus' affirm- affirmation of his upcoming death. They say, That's not how I, what I read in the Bible. That's not what I've heard. But they're only saying what they wanted to see in the Bible. Again, they're missing the forest for the trees because they could only conceive of a Messiah who would reign and rule physically. They were blinded to their own blindness. They didn't see the blaring problem of their own sinfulness that had to be dealt with first. And Jesus responds to them, but he doesn't directly answer their question, but he points them to the cross. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have light. Let darkness, less darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. And Jesus admonished them one last time, would you come in? Would you come in? He's the light that's just only going to be around for a few more days. And he says, if you continue to reject the light, then darkness will overtake you. And the idea is that darkness will seize them with a hostile intent. The revelation of the glory of God that you see through the pages of Scripture is not something you yawn at or something you scroll on your Twitter feed that you respond to or like. It's dangerous and deadly to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus and to do nothing about it. As I said last week, it's better to meet Jesus as a suffering servant before meeting him as a conquering king because then things are not going to go well for you. Verse 36. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. See, what they needed to become was sons of light, sons of God. They need to let glory in. They needed to find their identity in, find their worth in the cross, find their worth in Jesus in the gospel. And when they do, they become sons, sons of light. Listen, when you are drawn to God, you're adopted. He makes you his son. He makes you his daughter. You're not a slave anymore. Your whole MO changes 
You don't operate on a religious-based model of doing for the sake of God accepting you, but you now live on a model that's based on the gospel because you have been accepted by God. You go from a works-based narrative of life to a grace-based narrative of life. Listen, we either live out of a moral performance narrative where we're trying to get something from God or we live a grace-based narrative where we understand that God has accepted us and now we live our lives for Him. You are part of the family of God now. You've been brought in from the cold. My children, listen, my children don't need to earn the right to be my children. They're my children and I love them because they're my children. It doesn't matter how messy their room is. It doesn't matter if they never listen to me. They are mine. I love them. And if my love for them is flawed and weak, God's love for you as, your, as his son, as his daughter, is so much more incredible. You're loved. We who were once sons of disobedience, we are now sons of God. We who were once children of wrath are now children of God. We who were once sons of darkness and of your father was of the devil, we are now sons of light and your father is in heaven. You are a child of the king of the universe and my brothers, my sisters, that is glorious. That's glorious. J.I. Packer says it this way, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being a child of God, having God as his father. If that is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and his prayers and his whole, out and his whole outlook of life, then it means he doesn't understand Christianity very well at all. For everything that Christ thought, everything that makes the New Testament new and better than the Old Testament, and everything that is distinctively Christian is summed up in the knowledge that God is our Father. He's our Father. Brothers, sisters, this is where your identity needs to be found. In being a child of God and what He has done for you. You know, when we drift from this, this is a cause of our sorrows, our pain, our loneliness, because at those moments we become so much more concerned about our status. Am I a good worker? Am I a good athlete? Am I a good student, a good husband, a good wife, a good father, a good mother, a good pastor, a good friend, a good Christian? And if you walk that road and try to find glory and value and worth and identity and how good you are, you're going to end up lonely and insecure because it's all about you and what you can do. This chapter will be the last time that Jesus will speak to the crowds publicly. He has four days now left to live. He's about to walk a very difficult road, and Jesus is about to do it alone. Everyone will leave him. Even his father, for a brief moment, will abandon him. And Jesus will be all alone. You see, Jesus, as he walked to the cross, suffered alone on the cross so that he could be your righteousness, so he could be your redeemer, he could be your victor, so he could be your reconciler, and he could be your adopter into the family of God. This is what we talk about when we say the glory of God found in the face of Jesus. And this, my brothers, my sisters, is what we need to see this morning. This is what we need to pursue. This is what we need to know more of. This is where our ambition needs to be directed. So I'm going to invite you. Would you take time to reflect on these truths? Would you take time to reflect on these? If you're here this morning and you're suffering, would you reflect on the suffering of Jesus? As you reflect on it, would you find healing? If you're struggling with the fear of man and what other people think about you, would you reflect on his righteousness given to you by faith and faith alone, and would you find boldness? If you're here and you're fearful of Satan and the evils of this world and you're just living in fear, would you reflect on the triumph of Jesus on the cross, and through that, would you find courage? If you're in a broken relationship this morning, would you reflect on the reconciliation of Jesus for you and seek restoration today in those relationships? If you're caught up in shame, would you reflect on Jesus' adoption of you?
that he says he will never leave you, never forsake you, never abandon you. And in that, would you find peace? If you're here and you're new this morning, we're about to go into a time of communion. Communion is for those of us who have encountered Jesus and have declared that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. And so I'm going to invite you to take some time to reflect and meditate on the words. If you don't know Jesus this morning, there's some people that are in the back available. If you want someone to pray with you, I invite you. Would you go back there? Would you pray with them? Listen, pursuing Jesus will be the greatest thing you could ever do. And so as we go into communion, we're going to invite you to spend some time meditating on the words this morning. And the way we do communion here at Loft City is whenever you're ready, we invite you to come. If you would, go out the side aisles, come through the middle, grab the elements, and then you can go back to your seats. But whenever you're ready, come, grab the elements, and let's worship Jesus as we remember what Jesus has done for us. Let's worship Jesus.